from Matthew chapter 11 and reading from verse 25. And you'll find that on page 987, 987 of the Pew Bibles and, of course, on the screen. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal them. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Brilliant. Thank you, Colin. Well, if you didn't deserve an Oscar for the first two, then I'm sure that third one's just about sealed it. Shocking. It's probably the postal strikes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you said that if we're weary and burdened, we should come to you, and you will give us rest for our souls. Lord, you know the weariness and the burdens that we carry. You know that we experience a great chasm between the the life that you call us to, the life that you've made possible for us, and the life we're living now. And so we pray in this time that you would be our teacher, that you would show us what the good life looks like, and that you would train us to walk in your way. And Jesus, you said you are gentle, so please be gentle with us patient as we struggle to throw off the patterns of our old selves and to take up your easy, well-fitting yoke. So as we come to you, as we sit under your word, may your spirit make us new. Amen. So this autumn term, uh, we're launching a new vision for the church. Uh, We believe that God is calling us to become a Christ-centered, worshipping family of radical disciples, committed to showing and telling the good news of God's kingdom in Osset and beyond. And we believe that that vision, where we're going, is to be lived out through our mission, why we exist. So we exist to be and to make disciples who love Jesus as their greatest treasure, learn Jesus as their way of life, and live Jesus for the renewal of the world. And we started two weeks ago thinking about what it means to be a people with Jesus at the centre. Last week, we reflecting what it means to love Jesus as our greatest treasure, and why that has to be the foundation of everything else that we do. And this week, we're going to look at what it means to learn Jesus as our way of life. We are called to be learners or apprentices of Jesus, because that's what the word disciple means. So uh, for those of you who are playing bingo uh, for this sermon, Dallas Willard, uh, there we go, the philosopher, the Yoda of Christian spiritual formation put it starkly when he said this, the greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who are identified as Christians will become disciples, students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. The greatest issue facing the world is whether those who claim to be Christians will become apprentices of Jesus. 
Now just think about all the great things going on in our world at the moment, the great issues facing our world at the moment, the war in Ukraine, the cost of living crisis, a mental health epidemic. But Dallas Willard says this is the greatest issue. Why? Because as John John Altberg explains, Jesus did not instruct his church to create more Christians. He instructed them to make apprentices. Because there's no problem in life that apprenticeship to Jesus cannot solve. So let me just begin by asking a very simple question. Whose disciple are you? And before you all automatically say Jesus, because that's what you're supposed to say, ask yourself this. Who teaches me? Who forms my idea of what the good life looks like? Who is shaping how I live in the world day by day? Now, we like to think that we're we're our own people, but the fact is that we're all somebody's disciple. We've all learned how to live from other people. The question is, who? And again, before you just say Jesus automatically, ask yourself, am I really learning how to live in every area of my life from Jesus? Or when we take a deeper look, are our standard responses of how we respond and think and feel and act, are they actually more shaped by what we've seen on TV or what we've read in the Daily Mail or what we've come across on social media or what our parents have told us or what our friends think or what our culture at large tells us? So the story is told of the German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, there you go, another one for your bingo cards, uh, taking a a friend from Berlin with him uh, to the underground theological seminary that he'd set up. So this is in the time of Nazi Germany. The church, big crackdown on the church, Dietrich Bonhoeffer set up an underground theological college in a place called Finkenwald, which is in modern-day Poland. Uh, And Bonhoeffer's friend, Wilhelm Niesel, had heard reports of this theological college uh, and thought it all sounded a bit extreme, a bit intense, frankly a bit over-enthusiastic. And Bonhoeffer led his friend into a nearby clearing from which they saw hundreds of soldiers in a Nazi training camp just across the way. And then he pointed, so imagine the training camp over there uh, and the seminary on the other side, kind of over, over there. And he pointed at his little band of uh, ragged little school for preachers. And then, he, and then he pointed to the massed ranks of all of Hitler's troops. And in the, the prophetic tradition of contrast, he declared, this, the formation of God's people, must be stronger than that. The formation of the world." This must be stronger than that. The church's faithfulness to Christ amid such overwhelming pressure depended on its spiritual formation being stronger than the world's cultural formation. Now, you might well be sitting there thinking, well, that's all very well and good. We don't live in Nazi Germany. No, we don't. Thank God for that. But we underestimate the cultural forces that are working on us at our peril. So in his book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience, uh, Ronald Sider writes this, Whether the issue is marriage and sexuality or money and care for the poor, evangelicals today are living scandalously unbiblical lives. The data suggests that in many crucial areas, evangelicals are not living any differently from their unbelieving neighbours. And then he goes on. Church members are just as likely to divorce their spouses as non-church members. Church members' giving patterns indicate that they're almost as materialistic as non-Christians, and evangelicals are only marginally less promiscuous than their non-evangelical peers. And George Barner, who conducted the research, concludes, 
Every day, the church is becoming more like the world it allegedly seeks to change. So let me ask you again. Whose disciple are you? Who are you learning how to live from? Because if our lives are not so very different from those of our non-Christian, non-Christian family and friends, then the real answer to that is clearly not Jesus. And we need to repent and believe, which John Mark Comer says, it simply means to rethink your mental maps of what you think will lead to a happy life and trust in those of Jesus. So notice then that those three vital words that Jesus speaks in the middle of this famous passage from Matthew 11. Learn from me. Learn from me. That's the invitation. That's what it means to be a disciple. To be learning from Jesus how to live your life. Now, I'm also conscious that many of you here, uh, when you hear the word learn, you'll probably think about school, which you hated. There we go. Colin, at least. And learning in an academic way, in a classroom. But that's not what it means. It's not a download of information. It's about transformation through experience and apprenticeship. And the claim of Christ is total. The Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper says, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine! Remember what Dallas Willard uh, said is the greatest issue facing the world today. That Christians become apprentices of Jesus, learning from him how to live the life of God's kingdom into every corner of human existence. Every corner of human existence is the arena for our apprenticeship to Jesus. Every corner. Life in its entirety, nothing excluded. We can't follow Jesus in our finances, but follow the world in our love life. As David Watson put it, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he isn't Lord at all. So the goal of apprenticeship to Jesus is to live my life as he would live my life if he were me. Because guess what the Apostle Paul says? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So apprenticeship to Jesus means learning from him how to use my money. It means learning from him my relationship to stuff. It means learning from him how to handle criticism at work. It means learning from him my attitude towards love and singleness and marriage and divorce and sexuality. It means learning from him how to parent my kids and raise them in the love and fear of the Lord. Every area of life learned from him. Apprenticeship to Jesus is an all-in enterprise, but it takes place in the warp and weft of our everyday lives. Can, Can we honestly say that we live every corner of our human experience in a way that we've learned from Jesus? I know I can't. I want to be able to. Please, God, I want to be able to. But I can't say that. But that's what it means to be seeking to learn Jesus as our way of life. Now, Jesus was a rabbi, the Hebrew word for teacher. And of course, he was and he is more than that. He's the Messiah, he's the flesh and blood embodiment of the one true God. But he was a rabbi nonetheless. And like every rabbi, he had a yoke. Not sunny side up, um, an actual physical yoke uh, that farmers would use 2,000 years ago to to bind two oxen together so they could pull a cart uh, to plough a field. But 
the rabbis of the time used this as a metaphorical way of, of talking about how they read and understood God's words, God's instructions for living. So John Mark Comer, there you go, another tick on your bingo boards, uh, explains that a rabbi's yoke was his set of teachings on how to be human. His way to shoulder the at times crippling weight of life, marriage, divorce, prayer, money, sex, conflict resolution, government, all of it. And he goes on. What made Jesus unique wasn't that he had a yoke. All rabbis had a yoke. It was that he had an easy yoke. In other words, Jesus' offer is to teach us a way of being human, a way of being in the world that is truly life-giving rather than life-sapping. Does that sound good to you? Sounds good to me. So how do we learn Jesus' way of being in the world? Jesus gives three instructions in verses 28 and 29. Come Take, learn. First, we're to come to Jesus. To come to him means to look to him, to make him the focus of our attention. And second, we're to take his yoke upon us. And that means we're to take up his his way of being in the world as if it's our own. To adopt his practices, his habits, his lifestyle in our own everyday lives. And third, we're to learn from him, which means we're to enroll as his apprentices. We're to intentionally put ourselves in proximity, in proximity to him so we can watch everything he does and copy him. Because, and I, I love this, Tom Wright says, that's how Jesus came to know and to do his Father's will. Not by studying books about him, but by living in his presence listening for his voice and learning from him as an apprentice does from a master by watching and imitating. It's so simple. And it's so radical once we actually wrap our heads around it. So just imagine for a moment that you're an electrician's apprentice. What's the goal of your apprenticeship? To become an electrician. Fantastic. Does the master electrician on day one of your apprenticeship expect you to go and rewire a whole house by yourself? Not if they're any good, no. What would they expect of you? That you watch and learn. He'll take you along, he'll show you what he's doing, you watch him, learn. And then, as you spend more time with him, watching what they do, doing what you're told under their instructions and supervision, there'll come a point where he says, well, how about you do this bit of the house? And then he'll go and check your work. And then a little bit later on, he'll say, I think you're ready to go rewire this house by yourself. Now, the goal is that you're able to do everything that the master electrician does, right? And would you apprentice yourself to someone uh, who, you know, you went to visit them in your home before the apprenticeship and all the wiring is dodgy, there are sparks flying everywhere? No, well, I hope you wouldn't. Uh, You'd apprentice yourself to someone who you can see knows what they're doing. Someone you can really learn from, someone whose work you admire and respect and whose work you want to emulate one day. Now, if that's what an apprenticeship looks like as an electrician, what do we think it looks like as an apprentice of Jesus? What do you think the goal of an apprenticeship to Jesus would be? It's not a trick question. (laughs) To become like Jesus, to be able to do everything that Jesus was able to do. And if the apprentice electrician does that by watching and learning, how do you think an apprentice of Jesus will go? By watching and learning. (laughs) So what does that tell you about what the top priority for apprentices of Jesus has to be? To watch and learn. (laughs) 
And why would we apprentice ourselves to Jesus? Because he's gentle and humble in heart. In other words, because we see in Jesus the most beautiful life that anyone has ever lived. And we think, I want to live a life like that. I want to be able to love as he loved. I want to be able to forgive as he forgave. I want to be able to heal as he healed. I want to be able to be criticized without being crushed. I want to be able to fear God without fearing man. I want what he's got. And so, here we go, you're waiting for it. Dallas Willard writes, A disciple or apprentice is somewhat, simply someone who has decided to be with another person under appropriate conditions in order to become capable of doing what that person does or to become what that person is. So the only reason we would embark on the difficult path of apprenticeship to Jesus is because of the surpassing worth we see in him, as we talked about last week. If he's not beautiful to you, you won't have the stomach for apprenticeship to him. It will be too hard. You'll quit and you'll give up. But if he is for you, the treasure hidden in the field, the pearl of great price in the shop window, then even the greatest sacrifices along the way will seem easy. And Tom Wright says again, the ease and the joy, the rest and the refreshment which he offered all spring from his own inner character. His gentleness and warmth to all who turn to him, weighed down by burdens, moral, physical, emotional, financial, or whatever. He is offering what he has in himself to offer. If anyone in the world knew about suffering, it was Jesus. And if there is anyone in the world that I would want to learn how to suffer from, to know how to shoulder suffering from, it's him. The reason I want to be Jesus' apprentice is because I look at his life and I think, I want what you've got. Whatever it is, I want it. And that is his incredible offer to us all, to share what he has. Listen to the way that uh, Eugene Peterson translates Jesus' invitation in the the message. I love this. He says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Is that anyone here this morning that doesn't hear that and think yes please learn to live freely and lightly oh yes please learn to uh, get away with me walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it that's how we do it how many of you in this room right now can honestly hear Jesus saying that and say no, you know what, I'm pretty good as I am, thanks. Really? If you've got any shred of common sense at all, you're thinking, sign me up! I want that! Only here's the thing. Many of us who are here today have heard this verse before, haven't we? And we thought we were following Jesus, so why don't our souls feel more rested Dallas Willard again explains that the secret of the easy yoke is hiding in plain sight. The secret involves living as Jesus lived in the entirety of his entire, entirety of his life, adopting his overall lifestyle. Our mistake is to think that following Jesus consists in loving our enemies, going the second mile, turning the other cheek, suffering patiently and hopefully while living the rest of our lives just as everyone else around us does. It's a strategy bound to fail. And it, John Mark Comer paraphrases it this way. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, 
you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. Or to put it in the language of uh, the, the mission statement, we have to learn Jesus as our way of life. So what does it mean? John Altberg writes, the church is what? Is to make disciples or apprentices. The how is by learning to be with Jesus and by learning from Jesus how to live like Jesus. We do this through spiritual practices, through experiences like suffering and through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We learn Jesus as our way of life as we follow him everywhere and copy everything he does. We prioritize simply being with him, as we saw Mary did a couple of weeks ago. And we also do the things that he did to connect to his father, what generations of apprentices of Jesus have called the spiritual disciplines, or in Eugene Peterson's words, the rhythms of grace. Things like uh, prayer, Bible reading, reading uh, other devotional books, silence and solitude, fasting, Sabbath, community, celebration, service. They are the means by which we abide in Jesus the vine. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. And these were the things that Jesus did. They were the means by which he nurtured and cultivated his deep, intimate, conversational relationship with the Father. Now, some of you are going to say, yeah, but he was, he was God's son. But he was fully human. If, if Jesus had to go away and spend time with God in silence and solitude, what on earth makes us think that we get a pass? I mean, seriously, we really think that we're, we're, we're going to do, do better, with, uh, better than Jesus by not, you know, if he needs the silence and solitude with good, we're fine without it. Really? It's, it's been said that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it's getting. And perhaps, again, that's why the church in this country is in free fall, because we want the Jesus life without the Jesus lifestyle. We want to run a marathon without having to put in the hard hours of training over the course of a lifetime. The spiritual disciplines are like a workout for the soul. The results aren't instant, but over time, God will work through them to make us the kind of people who live like Jesus. And to some of you, this might sound dangerously close to heresy, that we have to earn our salvation. That's not it at all. But a a discipline is defined as any activity that I can do by direct effort that will eventually enable me to do that which currently I cannot do by direct effort. So in other words, it's about training, not trying. If I tried to go out and run a marathon tomorrow, I would probably collapse about three miles in. In fact, Tommy who plays football with me uh, would probably say it would be before that. But if I trained day after day, week after week, month after month, you know what, maybe by next, this time next year I might be able to run that marathon. The path of spiritual growth and the riches of Christ is not a passive one. Grace is not opposed to effort, it is opposed to earning. Effort is action, earning is attitude. And so the goal isn't just to try and change my, my outward actions and behaviours, but to change my inner character. So if you follow down in the passage uh, that we just read, uh, into chapter 12, verse 33, Jesus goes on to say this, Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Do you see what that means? We won't consistently live like Jesus unless our hearts become like his. An oak tree can try very, very hard to produce apples, but it won't happen unless there's a fundamental change that goes on in its very nature, in its very being. 
And so the same is true for us. We can try very, very hard to forgive people. We can try very, very hard to bless our enemies. We can try very, very hard to serve uh, our needy neighbours. But trying will only get us so far. It's training that allows us to do it naturally. Rowan Williams once likened the spiritual disciplines to sunbathing. He said, it's just about putting ourselves where the sun can get at you. For the spiritual disciplines, the the tried and trusted ways that God has met with his people for centuries, Jesus included. And so we're just, we're deluding ourselves if we think that we can binge watch Game of Thrones and dabble with prayer and become more like Jesus. It's not going to happen. Rankin Wilborn and Brian Greger write, people can say they want to be physically fit, but if they pay little or no regard to what they eat and don't exercise, then it doesn't matter how much they talk about wanting to be healthy. If they do not avail themselves of what is necessary, then they do not really want to be healthy, not enough to make a change. Our habits are often uh, are deeper than our convictions. In fact, our habits often reveal our deepest convictions. The point is, if we want to become like Jesus, which is the incredibly beautiful offer Jesus holds out to us, then we've got to organize our lives around the practices that Jesus practiced, through which the Holy Spirit works in us to change us. If we want to live Jesus for the renewal of the world, which is what we'll talk about next week, it'll only be as we learn Jesus as our way of life, which itself is because we love Jesus as our greatest treasure. Come, Jesus says, be my apprentice. Jesus models for us a new way to be human. The way God made us to be human. People outside these walls are crying out for a better way of living than than is on offer in the world around. And I believe the answer is Jesus. So will we learn Jesus as our way of life? Will we, by apprenticing ourselves to Jesus, show the world a better way of living? The invitation is gracious and wonderful. Come to me and I will give you rest. And the course of studies is simple. Take up my yoke and learn from me. If we want Jesus' life, the constant, conscious, intimate relationship that he enjoyed with his Father, from which all of his life and ministry flowed so powerfully, so richly, all we have to do is follow his way of life. But we warned, apprenticeship to Jesus isn't a part-time, distance course of studies. It's hands-on, full-time, whole life, lifelong. Jesus is accepting new students for his school of life. No prior qualifications are necessary. The question is, do you want to enroll in it? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you. We're tired, we're worn out, we're burned out on religion. Teach us to live your way. Be our master, train us. Be gentle with us. Show us what it means to live. That we may live every corner of our human existence from you and in you and with you.
for your glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. So in a, in a moment, we're, we're going to sing together. Um, and as we're, as we're doing that, um, for some people, just find a, a, a tangible way of, uh, of responding to God's word sometimes helps. And so as he, as he came in, hopefully you were given a little uh, piece of paper. I should have picked one up myself, but I didn't. Uh, but it's a, basically an invitation to, to apprentice yourself to Jesus. And some of you might just like, appreciate the opportunity just to fill that in uh, and to, to come put it in the, uh, in the box here. There are pens here. There are, there's a box here. Just a way of saying, yes, I want to apprentice under you, Jesus. I want to learn your way of life for myself. So if that would help you as a way of responding uh, to, to God's word, please do. Um, otherwise, let's, let's stand, let's sing together.